there and, and make sure the parking lot lights and everything is on. And uh, so very good he's already did that. I just didn't see that. So oh, there they are. And uh, so uh, sometimes we forget to do that. But if you have your Bible, might be turning over to Mark, uh, Mark chapter 4 tonight. And uh, I ask the Lord to help us with this. And, and uh, Miss Joan, are you feeling good these days or is your everything cleared up now and getting better? And Tom, in your surgery, and your up-and-coming surgery, I should say, everything's still on the plan for that. So be in prayer for that as he's got this cancer surgery up and coming here uh, to remove this, and we pray that, that would go well. Uh, to, do pray for Christopher. I was hoping to hear back again before church. I could update you, but be in prayer for Miss Cindy and Christopher there and the kids. I think Ruthie went and picked up the, the little ones from Boys and Girls Club or wherever they were this evening because Miss Cindy was at the hospital, so... I'd be in prayer for that, and also be in prayer for their mother, May. Uh, how's she doing? Is she, all right, so be in prayer for uh, Miss May there that she continues to get stronger and, and, uh, and recover uh, there completely, okay? Mark chapter 4 tonight, we're going to move through and look at the ending of this chapter and, and into the beginning of the next chapter. Uh, but Christ was just, uh, just not long ago, he's, he's called out and named his disciples, and now he's teaching, starting to teach them. And the Bible says in verse uh, 35 of chapter 4, And the same day when evening was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away a multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, and carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea uh, obey him? Now, real quickly, I know we looked at this passage many times, and you've probably read it over and over again and, and heard it preach much better than I can, but the, the idea being here, in verse 37 it says there was a great storm arose. And, and the reality of it is, and I'm, I'm not trying to misappropriate or anything, but, but there's going to be great storms arise in our lives. You know, we may not be on a ship with little ships in the middle of a sea and the, the wind gets up and the waves get big and the, the ship starts to fill with water. That may not be the storm that we're talking about. Uh, but whether it be militarily, like our country is facing right now with Syria and and then uh, uh, already what we've got on our plate with the military and what we're doing there. And, and then you've got the situation with Syria now and, and they're gassing of their own people and, and Russia seeming to stand in support of what's taking place and, and, and our pre president having to take a stand and, and say, listen, we're going to defend those innocent people and we're going to go to battle. It, it is, it is, not only is it wrong, but it literally is illegally, it is literally illegal to gas your own people. That's, I mean, it's been determined that. I know it's... We have these, you know, war crimes and things like that. But, but it literally says, no, we're gonna, we're gonna, we are part of a treaty, and we're gonna take care of this. And so we have this, and then we have two young men from our church that, that are in the military. So who knows what this role will play in their life, you know? And then we have the, the thing across our country right now with the teachers and and, and the and the low pay. And and I hope you know where I stand on that. We've talked, spoken that in the past. I want teachers to have a fair pay. I'm not against that. I don't know that I'm, I'm for every person and what every person is saying and the way they're saying it. I don't know that I'm, I'm, I'm in love with the, the approach they're taking. Uh, but I want them to get a fair paycheck. But I don't want our teachers to consider it a job. I want them to consider it a career. It's something they're, I mean, they're training and influencing minds. I, want, I mean, honestly, if, if a person wants a job that's just for pay, then find something that where they're not trying to influence people to do so. Because here's one of the things that bothers me about what's going on. The teachers, I'm afraid some of them, and, and often it seems to be the case, the loudest ones are the most vulgar ones or the most belligerent ones. They're not the most rational ones. They're not the most sensible ones. But they seem to get all the news media, all the airtime, and and, and what happens is it creates a following, and some people just taking advantage of that. It kind of like a, and I, I'm, please don't, I'm not putting all the eggs in one basket. Please don't misunderstand. we got two teachers in our room, three teachers in our room tonight, and, and I'm thankful for teachers. But 
some would just consider this kind of like a voluntary layoff. They, they, they would take an opportunity to be out of the classroom and, and hold a sign, and, but they don't really, they wouldn't have done that unless somebody hadn't have led, you know, led them into it. You understand what I'm saying? They're just looking for an opportunity not to do it. And what bothers me is you have some people that literally want to influence minds and train people, and they get thrown in the same basket m with the media as those that maybe are looking at it from a different perspective. So basically storms arise. And it affects everybody. It, this affects the way we think. It affects our country. It affects our budgets. It affects our young people because they watch this and they see this. And they may not they be in the classroom teaching them, but, but they're teaching them with their actions. And what we have to consider what we are teaching them, you know. And we have to consider authority. And then we have the, the financial thing in the stock market the last few weeks. And it's been roller coastering a little bit. And you know what? There's going to be storms that arise. There's going to be health crises that arise. A few short weeks ago, Miss Joyce was in church on a Wednesday night and went rode the bus with us over to Butter Jay's. And, and a week later, her left side was completely incapacitated. You know? Storms are going to arise. Uh, we have things uh, that have difficulty. Uh, six weeks ago, Heather was perfectly fine one day, and the next day she couldn't walk. Her back was out, you know? And, and things come up, you know? And, and, and we're going to have things that's going to... That's gonna, that's going to try to slip us up. And the Bible says here's a great storm. It, just, it wasn't just a, the, the normal storm that comes to our life all the time. Like, oh, okay, I didn't get to go to bed too early last night. I'm tired. Oh, I'm, I'm dreading today. I'm so tired. No, that's just normal storms. This says this is a great storm. This is something like they didn't experience every time they were on the water. They didn't experience this every time they went out. This is something that was different. And the Bible says it was a great storm. But what I love about it is in verse 39 it says, there was a great calm. So no matter how great the storm is, no matter how big the storm is, there's a greater calm that can come through Christ and his presence. And one of the things that we need to look to in times like this and in our country and what's going on, whether it be politically, whether it be militarily, whether it be financially, whether it be phys uh, uh, emotionally, whether it be with health and all the things that went there with the worst flu season uh, that our nation's recorded, you know, and, and all these different things that's taking place. We have to remember there's someone that can bring the, the great peace. Even though there may be a great storm and there may be great tragedy. And there, just, you know, the, the airplane that crashed there day, uh, not the one up at Scottsdale that killed six people, but there was one overseas carrying military and their family, 200 and some military and their family was killed when this, when this plane crashed, you know, and, and uh, a military plane carrying their, their military and their family. What? Algeria, there you go, I couldn't think, and, and 200 and what was it, 260 or 270 people was killed, and, and, and every one of those people on that plane represents families, moms, dads, nieces, nephews, brothers, daughters, sons, daughters, you know, siblings, and, and every one of those, and there's great things that happen, and, and then the, the tragedy there at Scottsdale with the plane and the six people killed all in their 20s, and you know, basically their whole life ahead of them, and, and, and it was taken back, and one of their mothers was on the news talking about, she said that, that she can't even breathe. She can't, what do you say? She said she can't even function. She's thinking about her daughter now being dead. And, and there's a great storm to rise. But, but the Bible says in verse 39, there can also be a great calm. And the Bible says in verse 40, that he said to them, why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no faith? And one of the things that I want you and I to think about tonight is when we face these great tragedies, these great storms, these great difficulties, we face these times that we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know the future. We can't see the other end then let's look, let's look to the Lord. And let's try to have faith in those moments that the Lord brought us thus far, and he'll bring us the rest of the way. And, and the worst it can be is to be with him. <laughs> I mean, literally, you know. I mean, I mean the, what, we still, what the world would say, well, what if, the, what if you die to live as Christ and to die as gain? I mean, I know we don't like to think sometimes about, you know, it's kind of like my pastor to say, uh, I, I, I'm excited about going to heaven, but I'd like to, I'd just soon catch the next bus, you know? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, we, we like to live, right? But the reality of it is, for the believer, it doesn't get worse, it gets better, you know? And we need to remember that when we live our life and face these things. And, and like I say, my grandmother here, unless the Lord intervenes, maybe in the next 24 to 48 hours, who knows? But she may not be here on this earth, but she'll be with the Lord. She knows the Lord's her Savior. And, and, the reality of it is, in that moment, all the difficulties of dementia and health and failing health and age, and those will be gone. 
And for those of us that know that she knows the Lord, even though we'll miss her presence, it's like we're glad that she's with the Lord, you know? And the Bible says here in verse 41, and they feared exceedingly. Let us see, it's the last thing he said to them, how is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said, notice this is the disciples speaking, what manner of man is this? This is, the, the disciples says that. And often in, our, in, in the church, Christians, we, we live our life and, and something happens and God does something and we say, wow, that's amazing that happened. Instead of giving him credit, we're just like, isn't that, isn't that amazing that it happened that way? Isn't it, isn't it a, and we, we just look over the fact that it was God that did it, you know? And we look over the fact that it's God that brought us through it. We just, we say, shoo, I'm glad that's over with. I mean, really? So we have to be careful about that as as. Christ, that someone said to me a couple days ago, he, uh, he said to me, he said, uh, he asked me about some different things about working and stuff like that, and I said, listen, I said, I, I'm really busy, I said, I, I, there's a lot going on in the church right now, and I'm just really busy with a lot of things, and he said, well, that's what we're all supposed to be doing anyway, is making disciples, you know, and reality of it is, we are, no matter what we're doing, we're supposed to be, we're supposed to be winning people to Christ and leading them and, and showing them, look at what it says in, verse, in chapter 5, we'll, we'll move through this quickly, so they're in the sea, the storm, this great storm rises, a great calm comes, Christ calms the seas, a great calm. He introduces to them that they have no faith, and now they're amazed, they're exceedingly, they're, they're, they're fearful, the Bible says, and they want to know what manner of man it is that even the winds and the sea obey, and now we start off, they get to the other side, chapter 5, and they came to the, over to the other side of the sea in the country of the Gadarenes, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tomb, out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Notice this real quickly. Here's someone that society said, we can't handle him. We've tied him up, we've chained him up, we've locked him up, and even though we do those things, he doesn't care what it costs him. It does, he doesn't care what, how much it hurts him. He gets loose from them. If he has to hurt himself to get loose, he gets loose. He plucks those things from him. Uh, he, 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 he finds a way to get out loose from all these bindings and all these chains. And, and, and so basically what they've done is say, let's just go ahead and let's just, he's dead to us. So we're going to put him in this place of the tombs. And that's just going to be where we're going to leave him. Out of sight and out of mind. We know he's got a problem. Matter of fact, he's got a problem more than we can handle. So our answer is, we're just going to dismiss him. And this is exactly what happens in our society. It happens all the time. Parents walk off from their children because they feel like having children stole their excitement and they abandon their children walk off and leave them they say i can't do it anymore now don't please don't mistake what i'm saying a person that realizes that they wasn't ready to have a child and give a child for adoption i'm not talking about those but i'm talking about the ones that you hear about all the time where they killed their baby and left it in a trash can or they just walked off and left and left their children someplace and uncaring about who would pick them up or where they would end up. We have people that live their life so recklessly and carelessly that, that they walk off from their, their own family. And, and we don't only have parents abandoning children, we have children abandoning parents. And, 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 and what happens was as long as mom and dad's got the money to, to get, buy them something, to give them something, to, to help them along the way, then they're good. But all of a sudden when, when mom and dad's getting a little older, and now I'm a little older, and mom and dad's saying, you're going to have to buy your own car, and you're going to have to buy, buy, pay your own rent, and, and you're going to have to, and mom and dad ain't got the money anymore. And, and all of a sudden the kid says, well, I'm done with you. Or the parents get a little older, and they say, I, I, I'm, I'm not, and they put them somewhere in some facility out of sight and out of mind, never to visit them. You say, does that happen? One of the things I used to do all the time when we lived in Tennessee, one of the things that we did with our bus route even was go into nursing homes. You'd be amazed when you go to nursing homes and you visit with people in there. Let me remind you, they're people. 
that have a life that they've lived, and many of them have exciting lives they've lived, but they got a little older, had some health issues, and their kids did not want to deal with that. And their kids put them in some facility and never came and seen them. I can tell you, it happens all the time. You talk to them, you say, well, where are you from? You're from this area? Well, blah, blah, blah. You have any children? Yes, but I haven't heard from them in 20 years, 30 years. Children abandoning their parents in the time. The Bible says we're to train them up as a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. And the Bible says if we train them up to obey God and to honor their parents, that God will lengthen their days. And the Bible says it's our responsibility to train them. It's, it's their role to take care of their parents. Not the government's role. It's the children's role. I can say this because she's not here, but I would not want to do it in front of her to embarrass her by any means. But Miss Joyce Scott and Jim Scott, and he's already in heaven now, but Joyce and Jim years ago shared with me and said, we wished we'd have been saved before we had children. But they weren't. So the moment they got saved, they started trying to get their children to Christ. They had already raised them very respectful and honorable, but now they had the principles of God's word to, to, to put in place. And they did. They've done a great job with their children. Miss Joyce and Rick could testify to this, and some of you others that have been by their house. Miss Joyce will not let you do too many things for her. It's not that she's, she's stubborn like her pastor. That she is. But she says, it's not your place. It's my children's place. She doesn't, it's not that she don't appreciate help, but she wants to make sure her kids know it's their place to take care of her. And, and they have, and they are. My point is this. We've failed our young people. We're robbing them. God says there's a blessing that comes from teaching them that, and we've robbed them of that blessing by not teaching them that. we failed them. We've moved into a society where we're living in such termo, term, tumultuous times that, that we just want to say, well, just out of sight, out of mind, and, and we just and we do, we do things like, and we, and we move away. One of the things I found out with coming to Arizona, knocking doors after about six or eight months, I came home one day and I was talking to Crystal. I said, you know what? Everybody in Arizona is running from something. I mean, literally. The snow, the ice, the allergies, the leaves, the whatever, you know, the law, you know family everybody's running from something i mean seriously i was knocking doors and it's like and, and you and they're not, you're knocked on hey where are you from what brought you out here oh we got tired of shoveling snow hey, what, oh i got tired of the cold weather i got tired of the ice i got tired of mowing the grass and raking the leaves i got tired of the they're running from something you say well what's wrong with that here's where i've tried to i literally from that moment i tried to get people at that moment i started i quit calling people summer i mean winter visitors and started calling them summer travelers. I tried to emphasize them being here. Not running from something, but God will meet you here. You may have fled something, but God still met you here. And see, what happens, we get in this mindset of just running from things. Well, I... I, you know, we have people that are 28 years old and had 14 jobs, you know. I mean, they've had 14 jobs in 10 years of working because they didn't like the job, they didn't like the job, didn't like the job, didn't like the job. Well, they're never going to find a job they like with that attitude. I mean, you got to work the job, you know. And to work the job, to enjoy the job, you got to show up and do the job. <laughs> and, and, and so we're, we're failing in so many ways. And so as a result of that, we're ju we just moved into mindset of out of sight and out of mind. And, and we just like the, this, this maniac here we often refer to him as. We just, we just don't want to deal with him, so we'll just put him over there. By the way, we do it with the conviction of the Holy Ghost in our life. Holy Ghost convicts us about something, and we say, eh, that's, that's going to make me uncomfortable. That's going to cost me something, some time or some resources, or it might even take some money to do that, and so I think I'll just, I'll just suppress that, and I think I'll just, I'll just move over here and run from that. 
and what happens is we left what God wanted us for something that we wanted to pursue. So what happens is this. We find them throwing him into the place of the tombs. This, this maniac, he had done everything. They couldn't do anything with him. Well, listen, our society is full of people they can't do anything with because we've never tried. We, we, well, we, we, we've chained them up. Chains wasn't the answer. Did you see that? But, but, but we've used fetters and chains, and, 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 and we've tried everything. And, and, but listen, that's not the answer, and we're trying that with our society. We're, we're, we're trying to do everything else. We're going we're gonna to use some physical means to fix everything, you know, like we've talked about in the past. What our nation is facing is not physical. What our nation is facing is spiritual. So we can throw as many laws and as many whatever restrictions or, or whatever. We can throw as many things we want at anything, but that's not going to fix the problem. We don't have a physical war that we're facing. The Bible in Ephesians tells us what we're facing is what we're battling is not flesh and blood. But it's powers and principalities and of darkness. It's a devil and his demonic beings and, and, and it's, it's, it's his devilish ways. And, and we're, we have to fight spiritual with spiritual. We can't fight it with physical. So they've thrown him out. They've set him aside. They've cast him aside. Uh, he's cutting himself. Uh, he, he can't, nobody can tame him. And the Bible says in verse 5, and always, night and day, he was, in the, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, notice this, but when he saw Jesus, he ran and worshipped him. I'm afraid that we have a society of people that are crying out for something. They don't know what it is, but they're crying out for something. Marking their bodies, cutting themselves, modifying their bodies, piercing every single thing in and out and over and abundantly. And, and just like, I mean, honestly, and they're, they're looking for something. They're looking for some satisfaction and drugs and more drugs and new drugs and stronger drugs and, and alcohol and more alcohol and flavored alcohol. And, and now we're mixing alcohol with coffee. I was walking through the airport there in, I don't know if it's Denver, Chicago, one of them, Starbucks on tap. They'll mix liquor with your coffee. And I thought, everything, anything, anything we can do, something else to give us a feeling of satisfaction. And yet, that don't satisfy us either. We need something else, something new, something stronger, something in addition to, right? I mean, it, seriously, isn't that right? Now they're not, now they're not just... I don't know what it's called. I forgot it was on the news here a while back. Now it's not just since marijuana is becoming more legalized. and We've got to be careful about that. Recreational anything is dangerous. <laughs> because it becomes approved we all of a sudden we we quit saying well you shouldn't do it you shouldn't do that hypocrisy our state became probably 10 years ago a smoke-free state you remember that how many of you was in our state when we actually voted on that and i thought I, I i voted to become that but i was amazed that it passed it's like wow even the bars, you can't smoke in bars even. It's like, wow, I never had heard of a state doing that before. Now there's multiples, but not the one that we're from. You know, and then uh, uh, Tennessee, that's not. And, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but I had never heard of that, you know. I thought, that's pretty cool. I mean, there wasn't even a smoke room anymore. You couldn't smoke in any buildings anywhere. I was like, that's pretty cool. But now we've approved marijuana medically. I know medically. So you can smoke marijuana. Now I know, I know there's restrictions, but here's the thing about it. The, the argument against tobacco was the carcinogens and the lung cancer and emphysema and things. The carcinogen in a marijuana cigarette is like 700 times what it is in a tobacco cigarette. But we say, this is medicine, smoke it. Uh, probably four years ago, not Walgreens, but CVS, 
don't know if they still hold to it or not, but they actually decided as a pharmacy nationwide they were going to quit selling tobacco because they felt that was counterproductive of what they were trying to do as far as helping people with their health. I thought somebody actually thought logically there. Somebody actually thought about something, you know, seriously. I don't know if they held to that, but at least they made that decision about four years ago or so. I haven't been in CVS in a long time, so I don't know. But, but my point is this. We, we've moved into a mindset to where everything else. So now, I, I didn't know what this was. I never heard of it until the news a few weeks ago. Now they're taking and, I don't know, I remember if they were scraping the, the leaves, not the bud or whatever of the, of the marijuana plant that they're using, but they were actually taking the, the leaves of the plant and like scraping them or washing them with vinegar or washing with something. And they were letting that dehydrate or, or dry up and dehydrate away. And they were having this whatever they call this. And now that is like the newest, latest, most powerful whatever. It's whatever the plant emits through its leaves, you know, through. And now they're, let, they're washing that off the leaves. And I thought, what in the world? I mean, we, we eat Tide Pods. I mean, are we, do you think that we're doing a very good job of passing along truth? We're just saying, well, they're in college. Let, let them live a little while they're in college. They're dying there. So we just put them there and said, we can't do anything with them at that age. Paul Ryan announced today, how many of you heard this? Paul Ryan announced he's retiring in January when his term is up. And you say, I don't know if, I don't like Paul Ryan. I, didn't, I don't care if you do or don't. That's not the point. I respect the man. He said, my kids have only known me as weekend dad because of my political career. I'm quitting while my kids are still teenagers so they will know me as more than just a weekend dad. I respect that man. They talked on the news. They said there was no way he would not have been reelected. They said he would have had the election wrapped up. No one else wants his job. <laughs> All he had to do was stay, and he'd had it. He said, I'm done. I am going to spend some time with my children while they're young enough to know that I love them. He's not putting them out of sight and out of mind and saying, go over there. I'm not, you know what? They're in college. They're in high school. They're in their teenage years. I don't even want to look at them anymore. Be careful with that. That's what society does. And all of a sudden, we have kids turning 18 years old, some of them even 15, 16 year olds, their parents find a permit, that are starting to mark and modify their bodies by the time they're 17, 18 years old, don't even have the mind to even understand how they, if it's going to affect their life, and they're marking and scarring and cutting their bodies before they even get out of high school and with no thoughts of the future. We're just saying, well, they're, they're, they're teenagers. I, you can't do anything with a teenager, not with the world's motives. Not by just setting them aside and saying, well, go do your own thing. That's what they did with this maniac. But notice this real quickly. But when he seen Jesus, when he seen Jesus, we need to introduce Christ to him. I was at Verizon yesterday and again up there today. And yesterday I was up there and I, I had my back to the, I was at the counter. But when I turned around, I went BJ and Frank walking out. They had been in there and I didn't even know they was in there. And then in a few minutes, Michelle comes walking in. I thought, we're going to have church and, you know, I mean, here comes the church family, you know. And, and, uh, but I was inviting them and there was a young lady there that back, I don't know, in January when Crystal got a new phone, we met and got to talk to her about church and invite her and things like that. And, and yesterday she came up to me, she said, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. How's your wife? How's your kids? I mean, just all the things we talked about in January, she still remembered. I went in today and was talking to the young lady there that I talked to yesterday to set up an appointment with, and, and the first thing I did, I handed her a gospel track. I didn't have one in my pocket yesterday, I handed her a gospel track. I said, hey, listen, I wanted to invite you. I invited you yesterday, but I wanted to give you a track to show you where, it, where the church was so you can take this with you. You won't have to. And at, at that time, there was a man standing there, Craig, and, and he's kind of the manager, and he said, he said, where's your church at? And I put out on their track, and I said, we'd love to have you come visit. On my way out the store today, Jessica, the girl, wait a minute, she said, we'll come see you. I thought, I'm hoping they do. I'm hoping they do. It's not because anything. It's because everybody needs Christ. Everybody. And we forget about this. Well, but they're but 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 you don't understand. They're it just happened, what was it, two weeks ago or something there in California had the gay pride. No, Hex Phoenix had the gay pride parade. Was it last week or two weeks ago? And we say, yeah. Yeah, we said, well, I don't, uh, they need Christ. 
You know why they're living that life? They're looking for something. And we've just told them, well, just one person said this a long time ago, and I, I'm, I'm not throwing them under the bus because they were under attack when they said it. But they said, what if we just took all of those people and put them on an island somewhere and let them live their life? What they did with the maniac. Out of sight, out of mind. By the way, that will never work. Because there's another crop coming up without Christ as well. So you, you can't round them up. So what are you going to do with them? Just let them continue to cut themselves and hurt themselves and mark themselves and cry out and, and run headlong into hell? Christ died on Calvary for their sins, just like he did ours. So I, that, but that sickens me. Me too. And if it sickens us, it really sickens Christ. And he said, take them to gospel. Because when they see Christ, they'll realize what they've been running to. When they seen Christ, he ran. He seen him afar off and ran to him. They ran to everything else. And you know what they found out? It's all a dead end street. It's just something else that's more misery, more pain, suicide, trying suicide, trying more drugs, more alcohol, trying to cover the pain, mask the pain. Run to Christ. And how are they going to hear that? I'm saying to you, how are they going to hear that? Because let me remind you, the disciples where we related ourselves to them a few minutes ago, we say, wow, look what he could do to the wind and the sea. But we forget he wants to do it in the hearts of the believer. <laughs> the reason he did it in the middle of the sea, remember, let me remind you, he wasn't worried about the storm. He was asleep in the hinder part of the ship, the Bible says. He wasn't worried. The storm was the least of his worries. He is the greater calm. His calm always is more powerful than the sea is, than the storm is. And we've got all this hurt and pain in our country that's going on, and people are hurting themselves, and they're living reckless lifestyles, and, and they're causing damage and pain not only to themselves but to their family and and future generations, and we're just letting them do it, and we're just saying, well, but we're just going to hoard ourselves up in, 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 the wall, in the church walls, and, and as long as they don't ever come in here, as long as they're just out there, they can cut themselves and scream and cry loud, but don't, don't you come in here and start that stuff. We need to take them to Christ. Catch this real quickly. You ever thought about this? Christ was in the sea with the disciples. And there was a storm. We have it a little bit in the middle of it. But guess if the storm hadn't come where the boat was going anyway. <laughs> the storm didn't change the direction of their journey. They were still headed to this man. I mean, really. Christ had a mission in mind and plan, in mind and plan from the beginning. We're headed, we're, we're going to the other side. Where's the other side? The Gadarenes, the maniacs there. And we, we feel like sometimes the storm blows us off track and we just, I just can't, I just can't do it. I just, I just can't go on. I just can't. But we got to realize where God was taking us in the first place. And he'll calm the storm. And we get there and we find out, we speak of Christ and say, God's done amazing things. He delivered us here and he kept us here and he brought us here. So the disciples say, what manner of man is it? Look what, look what the maniac says in verse 7. He says, Jesus, thou son of the most high God. The disciples say, who is this man? And the maniac says, Jesus. Because when he bowed to worship him, the great calm came. The peace came. And it wasn't some storm of wind and waves. It was the fact that he, he, the peace he had been looking for that people couldn't give him. Verse 8, and I'm hurrying, for he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. See, the lifestyle that people live may not be exalting of Christ, but that lifestyle is what Christ died for. Because that sin in a person's life is what put him on Calvary. 
and his love for the person that when the sin was removed is what kept him there. The sin is what took him there. But his love for the person after the sin is what kept him there. And what happens with my life and yours, and I can be as guilty as anybody, I'm telling you, I can be as guilty as anybody. I try not to be, but I, I got the same flesh that all of us do. I'm uncomfortable around that crowd or that person or that demeanor or that whatever, and as a result, I'll just say, I hope they stay over there. Now, I may not say that, but in my mind, I'm thinking, I hope they stay on that side of the street. I hope they don't move into the house beside of me. I've literally had people ask me in the past sometimes, can I invite such and such to church? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, have you ever had someone that knew someone that they knew that person wouldn't fit in, but they wanted to bring them to Christ? And they literally felt like they had to ask permission if they could bring them in because they knew they weren't going to fit in. So can I bring them in? Let's be careful. We have to say yes. We have to. And then we have to treat them as if they did fit in so that they will come to know the love of Christ, the calm that is stronger than the storm. Again, if our churches become too much like the world, they come to church, people walk through the doors of a church all the time, this church as well as others. They don't even have a church home. They're looking for a church home. They walk through the doors of a church, and they just find another replication of what they was, was suffering and going through outside. And they say, this is no better than where I was. I didn't find anything any different here. There was no more calm, calming or no more peace there than what I had on my job or what I had in my family or the lifestyle I've been living. But then we need to, they need to come in and find the presence of God. Where two or three are gathered together, here's the key word of that text, in agreement. Agreeing. When we have unity around the Spirit of God and the Word of God, the Bible says when we agree on that, that, that He will be in our midst. That's who they need to come to come in the presence of. They don't need to come in our presence. They're around people like us all the time. It just makes the storm bigger. They need to come into the presence of Christ. You say, what do you mean around people like us? Anybody have a temper besides me? Anybody? Has anybody ever felt cheated and you let them know? Has anybody ever re haste, hastily made a decision that you couldn't take back or said something that you wished you hadn't have said? And I mean, they're around people like us all the time is my point. They need to come to Christ. When they see Christ afar off, they'll see something that's different than what they've been around. And they'll fall and worship him. And then they'll cry out, Jesus, thou son of the most high God. Here's the point, and I'm finished. We're living in a time that God put us here in. We're living in what we often say is the, the last days, the end of the end times. Uh, any moment Christ could come back. We believe that. I believe that. I hope you believe that. I think it's true. Say, well, I don't know. When is it? I don't know. If I'm trying to predict it, I'll be wrong, so I'm not even going to try. <laughs> Someone says, no man knoweth the day or the hour. But I do know that he's coming. And the promise of his coming comes with the promise of those that are in him being in his presence. But it also comes with the judgment of those that have not been yet brought to him. And forever they'll be in the lake of fire. That's my family. That's your family. That's my neighbors. It's your neighbor. That's those that I've worked with and those that I rub shoulders with and those I do business with and and those are the people that we call friends. And those are the people that we, that we like. And, and, and people, literally, every one of us in this room knows people that are lost. Every one of us. So what are we doing about it? Well, hopefully someday. Okay. You can either be the one, we, 
I, you, we can be the one that takes them the gospel and brings them to Christ. Or we can just leave them out there and hope that someday somebody else does reach them. Well, I hope somebody can get to them, and yet we're not trying. Well, I hope somebody, and we're not reaching out. I know sometimes it's hard. People, we've burnt bridges. We've caused problems. We, 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 we've said things. We, we've built walls, whatever. We've done things. That I know, but what we need to do is this. Let's take one brick off the wall that we put up. Let's throw a string across the river in plans to build a new bridge. It's probably not going to happen in, a, in an instant. It's a lot easier to tear things down than it is to put them back up. But we've got to make an effort. But here's the key. It's not done in our strength. We need to pray. And not just pray like, yeah, we're praying. No, pray specifically. You know someone, then mention their name. Call their name out to Christ. It hurts my heart, honestly, it does. It hurts my heart to see so many young people throwing their lives away. I look at them, they're so smart. I mean, they, they are so intelligent. But they're throwing their life away. They score big on their test, or they get free rides through school, they get scholarships, whatever, and they're throwing their life away. I see them all the time, and you do too. Not just young people, but I'm talking about young people right now. No one's giving them the truth. So why don't we make a difference in their life? Let's bring them to Christ. The journey that Christ was on with the disciples was, was, was to this place of the Gadarenes. Now, I know there's more that's going to take place, but the storm may have come in the middle of it, but the storm didn't change the direction. They still made it to the other side because that's where they were headed all along. We have, to, we, get, we have to get some people that's been outcast as a side. We have to get to them and say, whatever comes between now and then, difficulties, turmoil, storms, I'm trusting Christ, the Prince of Peace, to get me through it, to get to them, to reach to them. I'm trusting Christ to get me through it so I can get to them. They need to know that. Lord, we come to you tonight. I thank you for what you've done. Be with us and guide us. Help us. Lord, I do lift up those of our church that are hurting. There are so many physical things that's taking place right now with so many people. Lord, I pray that you'd help and touch their bodies, Lord. Often physical things affect our emotions. They affect our spirit. And Lord, they even affect our joy. So I pray, Lord, that you touch and heal and provide peace like only you can through those storms. And Lord, for the storms that our nation is facing, whether it be financial, whether it be educational, whether it be military action, uh, Lord, whatever it is, Lord, what I pray that you would be, be political. Whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you would help guide us through those storms, that you would show yourself in that time as well and calm our hearts that we know that we're not relying upon some uh, government, some person. We're relying upon you to work through those institutions for your glory and for our good. Lord, I ask you now this evening to be with our church. As we, I do believe, Lord, this is a great church. And Lord, I believe you've placed this church here in this community for a purpose of reaching the people of this community with the gospel and encouraging those that are saved. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to take that up. Uh, help us to carry it with us. And we would realize that the commission that you've given us is to go to this Jerusalem and the surrounding Judea and in the Samaria that reaches beyond and in the uttermost parts of the earth. Lord, we, we do parts of that. We do it through missionaries. We trust them to do the uttermost. And yet, Lord, often we, we, we neglect the very Jerusalem that we live in. So Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be faithful, help us to be trusting. And yes, Lord, there are things that's going to make us uncomfortable. There's things that's going to cause us uh, to be fearful. There's, there's things that's going to cause us to doubt. And you, Lord, I pray our eyes will be fixed upon you, that we may go forward trusting you to see us through those storms, that you may be exalted when we get to the other side. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.